founder of one of the biggest websites uh, to have ever been made on the planet, um, responsible for, in its peak, um, ridiculous amounts of the internet traffic, which I'll ask him a little bit about today, um, called Pirate Bay, which became the biggest file sharing platform in the world. Um, since then, he's created projects such as Flatter, which he recently sold. Uh, generally speaking, he's considered to be a thought leader on the area of the open, free internet. Let's have a massive rock star welcome for Peter Sundar. Hey, hey. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Welcome for to Uppsala. The pack. Thank you for this weird thing, which is so not like me to get it's one of these. Usually I get arrested, but that's, <laughs> this is different. It's nice. Yeah, it's not very Swedish, but it's how we like to do things. No, I'm not Swedish either, right. even though everyone right. thinks I'm Swedish. That's one thing I'm not. Right, exactly. So that's, that's great. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, we like to start sort of start up going sort of right at the, the, the beginning. So basically kind of, you know, years zero to ten, you know, who was the young Peter Sunder? Where did you grow up? Uh, uh, what was your sort of family experience in your early childhood? Like, so, where so do you this, come from? This should be like a shrink kind exactly, of. Exactly, uh, yeah. We're going to solve this? all your life's problems no, here on this uh, No, so basically I'm like uh, most other kids, I guess, grew up in, uh, in Scandinavia. Um, weird mother, weird father. Um, crazy mother welder father and we moved around all over scandinavia and that's basically me so um i was uh, eight or nine and we got a computer me and my brother uh, amiga 500 which was the best computer at the time still one of the best computers in the world um and my mother's uh, friend said it was a great computer my mother went out and bought one as a present and then I started programming because there was nothing else to do with it. There was no games, there were no uh, nothing available. So we just had a basic compiler and that was it. What so kind of things did you program? Um, first, similar like small games that everyone else did. There was, um, I'm so old that you actually got paper magazines where you had code which you had to write down from the paper into your computer. Wow. Uh, so we did some of those, me and my brothers, uh, my, my brother, and then uh, later I made similar things but my own versions of it. And then uh, I started getting some games and started cracking some of them to get rid of the copy protection. Right. Uh, stuff like that in order to use the computer. Who else has done that at some point in their career? I think you're lying. There's about six hands here. I'm sure there's more people than that in the audience. That's good. And, and talking of games, I mean, so the, the, I read that the demo scene was quite a big part of your kind of uh, yeah. interest. I mean, for those of you who don't know, what is the demo scene? It's a small cult. Um, basically running the Swedish, uh, the Scandinavian internet and, and computer scene, I would say. Uh, everyone I know from back then, then, basically demos are small computer programs that, um, they're, that some good programmers made with uh, good graphic artists and music. So it's like a music videos almost, showing off what you can do with the computer in terms of both great graphics and great music, time with great effects. So the music then must have been kind of like do 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 like little MIDI kind of things and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it was not. Uh, yeah, or? yeah, but it was not MIDI, but it was uh, eight bit music, which is now a big thing in the in, uh, in the music scene. Um, Sixteen bit music on the Amiga, of course, but um, that was very basic stuff. Um, a lot of techno and and a lot of uh, drawings of you know hot girls in bikinis. That was like what, ASCII art kind yeah, of stuff. I'm not that old, but. Um, <laughs> No, but people basically were like 14, 15 year old guys, never seen girls, so they draw them instead. And then people made, you know, great music to that, which they never heard music before or something. It is a very different world. But most of these people today are people, run, you know, the guys from Dig Solutions making all of these uh, Battlefield games, they're all from the demo scene. Right. Uh, most of the people building internet providers in Sweden, they're from the demo scene. Right. Most of these people. It was, I, I didn't actually know much about this scene, but I, I made some notes. You had uh, Dice, Starbury Studios, Angry Birds, some of the developers that made Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, and King Do Kim Kim.com from Mega, oh, yeah, also yeah. part of the demo scene. I mean, these were like yeah. some crazy successful people in, in various forms, you know, but did big things yeah. um, in their future careers. That's why I call it a cult, because it is similar to a cult. Uh, I, I always joke about uh, these, you know, the chaos pilots, this, yeah. So I always, whenever I meet someone who calls themselves a chaos pilot, I always tell them they're, they're part of a cult, because it is kind of a cult. Like you have one in and then you have your, the network of people there. And uh, I remember in the dot-com era, 
I was invited to Stockholm to uh, for like a job interview at Spray, and there was a guy that came in to ask me about my programming skills. And he asked me like if I knew about the demo scene, and I said yes. And he asked me which group are you in, and I said which group I was in, and says hire the guy. I didn't even ask about uh, my skills because wow. I was in the right group. So it is kind of this cult thing, and it still goes on today. Right. Because you started, it was it Craze. It was your. Yeah. And you started a group called Craze. Yeah. And you st are you still a member of Craze? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like a cult. You don't know if you can ever leave. Right. That's the thing. <laughs> So let's it's let's not the only cult I've started, actually, but that's the oh, yeah? story. We can talk about that later. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, let, let's kind of then forward. So there's the demo scene, and then sort of uh, I make it so roughly 1999 time. So you're getting your first job um, or jobs. Um, you work for a company called Media Response and, and also Siemens. Like, how did you find that? I mean, I mean, I don't know if I can say this in the right way, but when I sort of think about Peter Sunder, I don't think of a developer working at Siemens or for, for a corporate company. Like, how did you... How did you find that experience? I don't. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had all of my projects and I had my ideas, but I also like most of my friends were people working trying to get a career or something. And I, I think I, Media um, Svar, uh, which I worked, was really funny because it was a small company in in Skara, which is in the middle of Sweden. The only thing it's famous for is bad dance band music. Um, mm. and I know bad dance band music. That was my first experience in Sweden. I came to. This and is a bit stayed? of a tangent. I did. I loved it. I, I went to Marlund to a thing called Dansbandsveckan, which for those of you who don't know Swedish culture, is weird sort of American cars and folk music, essentially. Although if you say that to a dance band fan, it's very offensive. So it's, it's dance band music. Why? We but should uh, interview you more. <laughs> you need to go to a psychiatrist. We should do a spin-off, a dance band spin-off. Oh, in don't. a barn somewhere. Dance bands grind. Yeah. Um, that sounds like something really awful. But uh, no, but um, Middlesbrough was really awesome because it was, you know, so you have, you have this crazy company in the middle of Skara. Uh, one of the uh, owners of the company, he was uh, basically drinking quite a lot. Um, and he bought an old uh, supermarket because he wanted to build the biggest uh, kind of web programming studio in Sweden. Um, then he decided to do something else and bought some nightclubs instead for the, so we were a company of, we had uh, all of these uh, buy and sell ads in newspapers in Sweden, it's like 50 of the top news magazines. We had like, you know, making the papers, you called into our phone number and we could print your ad in the newspaper. And then we made a digital version of that. We started making all of these uh, different things for Aftonbladet and all of these big clients, which everyone like uh, Framfab and Ico Media Lab, they wanted them as clients. And we were a few guys in Skara doing that. Most of these really cool stuff. Um, so while Spray had a very famous leather elevator in, in Sweden, we had basically people working for real rates, doing awesome stuff, uh, making the first like webmail service in Sweden and so on. Um, and it was, you could see like, you know, people that are farmers to begin with, they're a little bit more stable than the people in Stockholm at that time. Mm. Uh, so it was really interesting seeing like the dot-com bubble from a stable company. Then in the end, uh, most people don't know this, uh, the same company started Multipoker.com. Mm, yeah. um, so when I was in prison, my old boss was also in prison for a project that I was part of starting. Okay, well. wow. Okay. <laughs> that was, that was, Did you get to meet him in prison? Like no, kind of a... I, I met uh, a friend of his because he, uh, he got sent, sent away from, from a medium security prison to my, my high security prison for uh, some, some reason, who was the guy hanging out with my former boss. Did he uh, piss off the music industry? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. I, I, no, he uh, he smuggled the phone into the prison, so oh, okay. that's why they sent him to a high high profile prison kind of thing. But I mean, career wise, I mean, so where I like did you... this. You go from like prison to career wise. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we're we're getting to the prison stuff. Don't don't worry. <laughs> but I mean, I want to sort of think about what when you made this jump from sort of sounds like a fairly normal career and then sort of you probably had a fairly abnormal career after that building Pirate Bay and so I mean when did you make that jump from sort of career what why didn't you build that sort of career path like most people do in that position what caused you to stop that no I think the, the biggest thing that happened was that I, I realized I worked for unethical people and I I kind of got to the level where I started thinking about ethics and morals and why I was doing certain things and it was uh, um, I didn't feel okay with where I was working, and then I didn't want to work for them anymore. And I, have you seen this uh, movie called Office Space? Yeah. yeah. So my favorite movie, and there's one scene. There's a guy called Peter, uh, who's the main character of the show, and he doesn't like his job, uh, and uh, 
he says in one scene to this girl that he's really interested in uh, that he's not going to go to his job anymore because he doesn't like it. And she's like, that, that's crazy. What are you going to do for bills? And he says, like, I don't like paying bills. I'm not going to do that either. And I was like, I like this philosophy, so I'm going to do the same. Right. And now I owe 100 million Swedish or something. Yeah. Uh, but that was really important to me that I decided at that right. time, uh, very inspired by both like the, the, his movements in the movie, but also uh, but the, by the realization that I need to work on ethical stuff. Right. I, I didn't feel right in my stomach. So then sort of enter Pirate Bay, which back then was, was called Bay Files? No, that was, okay. uh, that was a later project. Oh, okay. There was no link to Bay Files? And... No, Bay Files was a uh, kind of clone of uh, Mega Upload. Mm, okay. Yeah. But um, no, so Pirate Bay was, um, so I, it was really important for me that I kind of found a belonging. So I was on IRC, which is an old chat network on the internet. Um, hanging out with people and someone asked if I could help out with the project uh, and I was really down and I wanted to find something which was interesting and I heard about the Pirot Biro, which was the group that founded Pirate Bay okay. and they needed some help and I started helping out and Pirate Bay was one of the projects that was started at the time. Okay. Um, so I started helping out with that and it just turned into like we decided uh, from, from Pirot Biro was this weird group of activists and hackers and, and artists and very different people coming together to work on like uh, thinking about the internet that was the, the idea hmm. just thinking about the internet doing projects about the internet um and, and just very early internet kind of vibe so right? was it always a, a file sharing platform as it is today still or, or is it was it something different? Was it just kind of a creative melting that was, pot? Uh, that was, so Pirate Bay started out as a testing of BitTorrent technology. So we had a forum for Pirot Pirot, which was uh, a lot of people basically writing about uh, where to copy things or which ISP was good and bad and just internet stuff. Uh, and, and then people wanted to talk about the Torrent protocol and we decided to set up this testing of the Torrent protocol. So we found a, a ready-made uh, website. We, downloaded that and installed on one machine and then people started using that and, and it was all of a sudden just became really, really big by itself. And we decided that we didn't want Pirot Biron as a group to be the same thing as Pirate Bay. So we split it out into separate entities kind of. Right. So, so Pirot uh, Biron was more of a think tank and, and so on. And what point did you meet? You so your, your three co-founders were uh, Frederick, yourself and, uh, and Gottfried. When did, you, when did they enter the scene? Did you kind of meet all at the same time during... No, we were hanging out in the IRC channels. Um, and, you know, it just... I, I think I met them like a year after I started working with them. Okay, like so it's mostly online relationship. You didn't meet them physically then? No, thank God. Okay. <laughs> so every time I, I, I've met them, they piss me off so much. I don't want to be near them. Right. That's still the case today. So, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, uh, we were discussing this slightly earlier, I mean, when new projects, startups or whatever new project you want to you call it, kind of get started, the advice people tend to get is, you must love your co-founders because yeah. otherwise everything else will fail when the, the shit hits the fan. That's the, the, those are the people you need. I mean, sounds like you didn't really like each other that much. I mean, no. was no, that No, we, we are quite opposite, yeah. No, but I think that was actually really good and really important to the, the Pirate Bay project is that we... We didn't agree on anything. We still don't agree on anything except internet freedom and file sharing stuff. Um, and that made this possible for us to focus on one thing and we had common enemies, which is always good. Um, so we could work together on, on that and then shut up about everything else. So you kind of get rid of the, the love focus. Right. Otherwise you spend time with your coworkers after hours and stuff like that, right. which you don't want to do with the guys from Pirate Bay. You don't want to spend any time with them whatsoever. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Pirate Bay gets started, you start to see kind of growth. Was, was it initially kind of always fast? Was it like kind of a tap, just boom, growth suddenly? Or was it a slow burn? Or So it was, uh, it's always been incremental growth, but then you can see like certain steps. There were certain times in history where Pirate Bay grew quite rapidly. And, and the first thing was, uh, there was a Spanish website, a torrent site that shut down. And they didn't know where to go with their uh, Spanish file sharing. So they came to Pirate Bay, which was, I don't know if they confused .se for .es or something, but they just <laughs> came to, to, to Pirate Bay, which was in Swedish at that time, which was uh, one of my favorite stories about Pirate Bay is that like all of a sudden the top 100 list on Pirate Bay goes from being basically Scandinavian shitty movies like Wallander and 
stuff like that, uh, to all of a sudden being like all of these weird Spanish things, no one understands what it is, uh, except the top downloaded thing, which was an audiobook on how to learn Swedish. Wow. Uh, I think I downloaded that at some point. Uh, but you still, uh, you should speak more Swedish, but that's a different story. Uh, but uh, it was just very funny, and, and I, you know, I, we realized at that time we needed to do something about pirate bay and translate it into different languages, which became a thing. Uh, that we, we translated to many, many languages because we realized they it was important for people in other countries as well. Um, that was one of the, the biggest kind of movements. I always got really upset that no one gave you like a diploma for getting people to learn Swedish from Spain or something like that. Mm. Like the government should just hand over like, thank you for your you know efforts in getting people to understand our culture and spreading Wallander and shit. But wow. it never happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that was that was the the first like big step, and then otherwise it's been like the stable growth of two, three to five percent every month, um, forever, still going on today, I would guess. Um, but then there was the raid against Pirate Bay, which uh, was the best advertising ever to happen in Pirate Bay's life. How, how big did Pirate? I mean, to get some perspective, I mean, I've heard various statistics, but I mean, fr from you yourself, how big was Pirate Bay? What are the kind of stats? So, peak. so we saw that after the raid, um, when Pirate Bay went down for a few days, um, almost 50% of the internet traffic vanished in the, in the world. <laughs> wow. Which That's was fairly big, big, I would say. And I, I was at this really amazing uh, uh, kind of uh, internet provider technology conference, and people from, I think it was Cisco, were discussing about uptime on the internet, how to get like the last 2% from 98 to 100% uh, uptime for the internet and so on. And for me, it's like, why don't you just get Gottfried into rehab? Because that's like much cheaper, because that's like 50% of the internet traffic, right. you know, that's... Because uh, he, he tripped over a cable once. I don't know if it was drunk or high, and he tripped over a cable, and the router broke, and like 40% of the internet just vanished. That's and then incredible. people are sitting at the conference talking about, if you spend this extra billion, you can get 2% more uptime. And I'm like, or you get Gottfried into rehab. Right. <laughs> a cheaper option, better option for everyone. That's amazing. I mean, and then this kind of scale, and you're still basically three three people? Yeah. That's yeah, and, and, and not to be, like, it, one of the most important things has always been the community around Pirate Bay. So, like, uh, moderators and, and people uploading and downloading, of course, are. Right. So, so the platform, which was really important to me, the platform has always been just a platform. Uh, it's not that hard to actually have it up and running because it doesn't take that much time. The thing that took time with Pirate Bay was everything around Pirate Bay. It was never the technology or anything like right. that. Right. I, I heard you say a few things about the fact Pirate Bay was never really good. It was yeah. just the sort of last man standing to yeah. some degree. Because you know you had all these other competitors dropping out and you were the you were the final to sort of stick in there and, and, and dodge all of the legal letters or well not dodge them, you just didn't give a shit about them. No, we replied to them. That's the funniest thing we did. We replied to all of them and published them. What and what did you say mostly? Uh, go fuck yourself. Right. Uh, I, I remember we were discussing we're Googling uh, which baton was the best for anal uh, stuff uh, and handing out recommendations on that, like based on the evidence right. we found. Right. Um, that was the I mean, really interesting what thing. Do you what do you think made like the, the core difference? Because I mean, that's kind of scary, right? You're, th you're three people, you know, you haven't done this before at this scale, you know, and, and, and lawyers are sending you letters, paid presumably quite a lot of money to do that. And, you know, what makes you different? Like, why did you three decide, okay, we're going to just stick with this and keep sticking with it? Like when everyone else kind of dropped out, how do you fight that fear? What, what drove that? Fun. It was really fun. Um, that was the basic thing with fun. And then I think the, the, the common thing between the three of us is that we really don't like other people to tell us what to do. Uh, so that was like the fighting factor. It's like, it was really fun. We got a lot of, uh, people were really happy with what we were doing. People were always been super nice to us and um, unfairly so even. Um, so, and also there is an importance to this. Like I realized, like uh, meeting people from all over the world, going talking to people and so on, how important Pirate Bay has been to them. And we don't get it as much here in, in Scandinavia, but um, going to the Balkans or going to South America or anything, uh, places like that, you, I always meet people who just want to come and tell me like I wouldn't speak English without Pirate Bay, I wouldn't have uh, my job today without Pirate Bay because I downloaded this and this illegally so I could learn this and this thing. So my trade is based on piracy and so on. Mm. And, and those things have been really, really valuable, which is much more valuable than money. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
what did what is sort of day to day life at Pirate Bay look like? I mean, you you were three people, you were you were all remote, so you weren't together in an office. What was your? I mean, this this is a huge platform by this point. Presumably, it's quite a lot of work to maintain. I mean, how did you how did you split responsibility? Did you have someone in charge? Was it a flat structure or no? Whoever was not drunk or gone took care of the things that needed to be taken care of. Right. And that is a, that is not a joke. I'm not exaggerating. This is the thing. Um, if there's something that needed to be done, it's like if you could do it, you could you do it. And it kind of made itself like we, we noticed that Frederick took care of the servers mostly because it was more interested in that. And we kind of split into interest groups, I would say. Right. Um, but it was, I, I always loved when we got these emails from people that wanted to come to our headquarters or our <laughs> Swedish office or something like that and interview us or maybe have an internship or stuff like that. And like, we're three people working from home as a hobby project. It was like weird. Sometimes I even responded with like, if you can find this house, our building, which is secrets, you can come work for us as an intern. And then I sent a picture of something, some huge house in China or something. <laughs> um, it was really funny, you know? Um, but it, it, it's, it was this, uh, people was, they were always trying to look at us as some sort of company or just expecting to be a company. Right. And it was never like that at all. Were you so, never tempted to, you know, get some kind of crazy un underground lair of some sort, like, you know, or, and become more of a kind of physical base? Or was I, that temptation never there? That. No. <laughs> okay. Because if you have an underground lair somewhere, right, then you would you, you wouldn't should say not that talk on about Startup it. Grind, no, presumably. No. So. Um, From experience, I can say you should not talk about it. Right. Let's talk about sort of revenue. So this is a you know, point. I, I see various sort of quotes of, you know, someone quoted you, you were making in, your, in, in the prime $4 million per year in revenue. Different people said different things. I know in the court case there was a lot of um, tension around this figure where they were kind of trying to guess how much Pirate Bay was making based on the vague responses you were giving. And, yeah. You know, how much did Pirate Bay make? Can you tell us how so much the, the revenue was? the court case proved that we lost 200,000 Swedish during the court case time. Now, so the court case proved that we lost 200,000 uh, Swedish during the the, the the time of the of the, the legal case, um, and most of the time when Pirate Bay was shut down, it was because we had unpaid bills, and we always played that it was like someone trying to shut us down, some government, but we didn't have money to pay the bills most of the time. Mm. Um, so some other people probably made money from Pirate Bay, like the advertising uh, people that took care of the advertising probably made. One of the really annoying things that happened is like I remember there was a company that wanted to do advertising on the front page of Pirate Bay. And there was never any advertising on the front page. It was really, really important that we never had that. Um, and so we gave them an insane quote. Like, yeah, if you pay us this insane amount of money. How much money? Uh, I don't remember. It was maybe like 800,000 Swedish per half hour or something like that. And then someone quoted, they're making this much money. Right. Like, uh, yeah, uh, no, that's not right. how it works. And in the court case, uh, actually, the, the, the prosecutor had a list called uh, the top 10 most successful websites, uh, website revenue in the world. And he said, like, if they make this much money per advertising spot and Pirate Bay have 65 advertising spots, because he calculated, like, every time you search for something, there was a new advertising spot. Like, Ooh. it's not the same search result. So every search result was a new advertising. So he just, like, multiplied by 65 or something. Right. Uh, this is how much money they have made. And then they said, you should prove that you did not make this money. Like, that's kind of impossible. Uh, but the only figures ever out there was that we lost money. Ooh. And... I've never seen any money. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> Are you depressed about this? No, no. I believe you. Yeah, but the, no, for me, it was important that we didn't make money. Yeah. Um, because it, it, even I wanted to operate at a loss because we didn't want it to be commercial. We didn't mm -hmm. want it. But then again, we couldn't afford to pay any of the, the legal uh, fees. So we had a free lawyer. We didn't have money for hosting most of the time. So right. some of that was sponsored and so on. Right. But it was really important that it was not a commercial entity which it turned out to be later on, but. Okay. So, you know, 2006, basically now we're at sort of crunch time where essentially that was the raid, 2006. And, and so my understanding was that Motion Picture Association basically kind of triggered this and basically got the Swedish Ministry of, Minister of Justice to send in the police. And, yeah. Um, talk us through that. Like what happened? Like, what were you guys thinking? Did you see that coming or was that a complete surprise? Or No, we, we knew that they were going to do something about it, uh, even though we also knew that they said it was not illegal. They agreed to 
six weeks before the Pirate Bay raid, they said in a memo internally that Pirate Bay is doing nothing wrong. I can even quote one particular sentence saying like, these people are really clever. They know exactly how to operate within the law. So I have that in writing from the prosecutor. Mm. Then he decided to do a raid against the Pirate Bay anyhow. Right. Um, so uh, we were suspect expecting something to happen. And there's a parallel story to most of this. Uh, so we were running, uh, especially Godfrey and Frederick, we were running a company together called PRQ, which I helped out a little bit with, which was a hosting company. It, it's still, I think it's still operating in Stockholm. And one of the clients was uh, a Chechen rebel movement called Kavkaz Center. Um, they're not allowed to operate in, in Russia, so they moved to Finland. And after Finland, where they were raided, they moved to Sweden. And the, uh, the owner of the website, he got a, um, uh, what's it called, one of these documents that he's, uh, he's the publisher, editor of the newspaper, so it would be protected by the uh, Freedom of Speech Act in Sweden. Um, and um, the, the prosecutor uh, that actually prosecuted the Pirate Bay, he also prosecuted this website, and he made a raid against PRQ to find this website and took it down, and we, of course, put it up again because it was protected by Swedish law. Um, and he did this a few times before the Pirate Bay case. So we already knew that he was going to do weird stuff and so on. Right. Um, so we were kind of expecting something, but not on the scale and not because of the pressure from the US. Mm. Is it, the, I think the contention around this topic at the time is that there's, there's this law in Sweden, Sweden particularly picky about this, the minister's law of some sort, minister's rule, I think yeah. it's called. I don't know what that translates to in Swedish, minister's regler, maybe. Um, I'm miles off, aren't I? <laughs> I, I can't remember the name of it, so I'll, I yeah. can't correct you. Essentially means that, that, that you know, politicians and ministers can't meddle with government agency stuff. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much what happened, that, you know, yeah. that Hollywood contacted the Swedish government and then the yeah. Swedish government sent in the police. So. And then the Minister of Justice said, we'll put all of the documents on the table so you can see we did nothing wrong except these 747 documents. Right. Yeah. And how much damage did that cause on the raid? Did that cause devastation to Pirate Bay or...? No, uh, we managed to have backups, so there was no problem. It took two, three days to get, I think, three days to get Pirate Bay up. One day was celebrating how much traffic we were going to get, um, and then two days to get it up and running again. So uh, people all over the world handed out machines, and we uh, could rent and borrow machines from people quite uh, quickly and get everything up and running. Right. And I guess you had sort of contingency plans for this in place, presumably. We should have had better ones, but uh, we managed, like, uh, thank you, archive.org, where we found most of the pictures from Pirate Bay. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was really good. Uh, but uh, we had some of you the code. the Wayback Machine and doing that. We, we took some of the stuff from the Wayback Machine, yes. <laughs> wow. uh, But we had, like, 80% backup of everything. We had a database and we had the website code. Right. Yeah. Um, in terms of the ethics of, of, of Pirate Bay, this, is a, this could take you know, five hours in, in itself. But I mean, in summary, I mean, I was fairly new to this whole topic until we sort of were going to interview you. So I did a lot of looking into this. I mean, my initial sort of thoughts, I think like many people is, OK, you seem like a really nice guy. But this is surely illegal, right? This is breaking laws. And what about the you know, musicians and artists and producers of, of software that, that suffer as a, as a result of not earning money from their projects, from having yeah. stuff on the Pirate Bay? That, that's the kind of, I guess, the common thing people think of. I mean, what's your response to that? Like, do you, do you agree that's a problem or do you, do you think that's wrong? Or? I, there, there are many, many, many layers of this. Uh, one of the biggest things is that, first of all, you don't have this right to make money from things you make. Um, it, you, you have to be successful as well. Most of the people that complain about things being shared on the Pirate Bay don't have any success at all to begin with. That's the, the, the common thing. Like, uh, the Swedish people that have called us up to complain about, like, I remember... Uh, some of the Swedish producers calling, uh, movie producers calling me up in the middle of the night complaining about how bad their movie is doing in the cinemas because it's on Pirate Bay and people are downloading it so they don't go to the cinemas. And I couldn't even find it on Pirate Bay because no one wanted to see the crap. Right. Um, that's a very common thing. Right. Uh, so, so there's one misconception. Then the second one problem is that uh, it's not about um, making money from the things you do. It's about finding a funding that works for everyone involved. Um, so that's the reason why I started Flatter is because I, I didn't see that we had a working funding method right. of um, like the, the easy way we can share information also need an easy way to pay for the information. But we still have this move from an old copyright scheme that does not work on the Internet and it does not work um, with how people want to behave. Mm -hmm. um, so rather we should try and find and put efforts into finding a, a suitable method of funding things than trying to force people to do things badly. Um, so that was the, the biggest thing that um, I wanted to do with Pirate Bay was to make people 
to push people a little bit to, towards that um, and, and the discussion as well. And then on the separate thing, if you look at all of the statistics and research going into researching copyright, um, it proves that the more people download, the more money they spend in the industry. But it doesn't go the same way as it did before because uh, let's say you download music, you go and buy an album. Uh, but then that's great for the record companies, but rather people would not buy the album, they would rather go to the concert of the person or they would do something else which would fund that, um, uh, that artist. Mm -hmm. And for most people, you can see that the shift has been from uh, the record companies, the money does not go to them anymore, but rather goes to artists. Right. Um, and it's not going to the top 1% anymore, it's being spread more evenly about to everyone else. Um, so so it's been, the, the research is really clear. But that's not really good for the record industry. Mm. So uh, and the problem is that we always confuse like the music industry for the record industry. Right. The, music, the music industry is much larger. The record industry is one subset that does not really have to be there anymore. Right. Um, but they're the ones complaining and all of the artists are in the contract with them. And this goes for the same with books and movies and so on as well. Mm -hmm. So the, movie, the, the money has shifted, but it's more money. So we should look happily about that instead. So if you right. want to do something good, you should download and spend your money into the artists. I mean, where does like I mean, Spotify and and Skype two interesting cases because well, firstly they're both Swedish. Um, ha, yeah. Actually, Skype's founder grew up here in Uppsala, and uh, you know one of the founders. The, if yeah, you go, one if you go them, to Denmark, them, Skype Finnish, is Danish, right. and if you go to Estonia, it's Estonian. Right, exactly. That's, that's Some good. Estonians were actually here the other yeah. day, and, and if you go to any asylum when I said Skype was Swedish, <laughs> yeah. well, it was very funny. I, I went to, with Flatter. We went to meeting a lot of these venture capitalists, and they all bragged about uh, fun, the uh, investing into Skype. Except Niklas Sandstrom, when I met him, he didn't say that he invested in Skype. And he didn't even mention that he created Skype, but it was mm. just like the only one who didn't say that he was part of Skype. Right. Um, it's the but, story. I mean, yeah. People uh, may probably, I suppose, how many of you know about Kazar and the connection between Skype and Kazar? Probably quite a few of you here. It's, I'd say maybe 20, 30% of the audience. But I mean, many people don't realize that Skype and all the success came from initially a file sharing platform called yeah. Kazar, yeah. which was the technology behind Skype before it sort of, you could say, pivoted, the dreaded P word, and uh, went, went towards being a voice over IP platform. And um, Spotify, you know, went a different route, but, you know, they, they've both basically created billion dollar empires out of, out of this, um, you know, this thing. And, you know, how do you see those companies? Do you see them as good or bad or do you, do you like them or, or dislike them? Or? So Skype gives you something that you do and it, 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 that is a billion dollar company. The other one is a company losing a billion dollars per year, uh, Spotify. Right. So let's keep that in mind. Sure, it's a billion dollars, but maybe minus and plus doesn't really matter in that world. <laughs> um, for me, it does. <laughs> But, but I, I think it's, uh, I'm okay with Skype. I'm not super happy that it's being centralized. That's one of the issues. Like we could have a peer, actual peer-to-peer -peer, uh, phone service, which Skype was supposed to be to begin with. Uh, it's being centralized. I'm not super happy about that. The problem I have- by Microsoft now. <laughs> which is uh, great on Niklas trying to, this uh, thing with Niklas, he always said he wanted to make Skype into a subscription model, but then we realized his, the, the subscription is him selling Skype over and over again. Um, <laughs> it's really funny. Um, but uh, the, the problem I have with Spotify is, of course, that it has centralized all music again. So it's sense, uh, kind of centralized all of the things we've been working on, actually distributing music to everyone and, and taking away the middleman of that. And it's not about the money, it's about the control of it. So. Um, so I, I travel around the world quite a lot and very often I, I meet people in, in, in uh, developing countries and they're always upset about Spotify because they don't have it. And since people in Europe and the US have Spotify, they don't file share music anymore. So they can't access that music because we're not solid, in solidarity sharing this music with them. Right. So we're creating this again, which Pirate was trying to take away the class system of the internet, trying to make one class, everyone is equal. We now have again, um, two classes, people who can afford music and can access music and people who are not in a marketplace where, where that is interesting or can afford it. Right. And still, ultimately, it's the, it's the very few profiting from this that, you know, Spotify profits massively from music, but do the musicians profit massively from Spotify? That's the question, maybe. maybe but then I don't think that the whole idea of, of making music, uh, making money from the music itself, is uh, it's not going to be very popular. It's not going to work that well. We need to find other methods of that. Mm -hmm. um, like CSN, do you know CSN? In CSN, Sweden? the uh, Centralia Studienemden, where oh, you right, get your student loan. It's the, yeah, most, right, yeah. the most important thing for music 
in Sweden. Right. Uh, right. People loan money, they don't go to school, they make music instead. Mm -hmm. That's much more important than how much money people make from copyrights. You, you could argue that's because when you're a student, you have sort of a very basic low level that you need to cover. You know, you eat pizza every day, the occasional kebab, and you know, yeah. maybe not you, you're a vegan, it's a bad example, but uh, you have very low vegan kebab. You have, right, yeah. yeah, vegan kebab, yeah, that sounds terrible. It is. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, you have low cost, but yeah. then you know, you grow up, you want to buy a house, you yeah. want to have a family, the cost associated to that. So how do you justify that kind of model? Those people need to make money too. Um, but but if you're if you're really bad, uh, let's say a bad welder or you're a bad uh, carpenter, would you still get paid? Mm, you should, should you still get money should, from who? Right. Who should pay you just because? Okay, everything you do is crap. Um, should should you still get paid? Mm. Maybe you should find something else to do because that's one of the problem with most musicians that are complaining about the copyright not being mm. not paying them enough is because they're not really that good. The right. people that are really good will find some other way of making their money, and that money will come mostly from licensing to TV or licensing to radio or stuff like that. And that's the whole thing. We need to find alternative methods right. uh, because it's not working. It's not because it's not go, it doesn't go hand in hand in, in how we actually behave as people. So let, let's cover this sort, of, um, this sort of court process because you know, at this point we talked about you know, there was this raid and then, then there was this massive long drawn process of court battles roughly 2010 to 2012-ish. I think the last, I think the actual news was delivered to you. I saw a video on YouTube of you getting the news actually. You were in Cambodia I think with Gottfried? I Laos think it, with Frederick. Oh right, okay. Almost close, close. the same. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> two different assholes, right. two Asian <laughs> countries. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you essentially, you know, got this news that you, you, I think at the time it was $7 million of damages that went up to $7 million. The, the court sentence went yeah. down, I think, to, to six months, I think it was. Eight. I mean, yeah. how did it feel? I know at the time you, you, you were seen phoning your mum. I mean, that kind of, for me, made that feel quite real. I mean, yeah. I, I have a mum and, you know, I just kind of thinking this is a real person that you must have been pretty gutted. <laughs> I, I, I mean, was really angry because that's the thing. Like, um, we didn't do anything wrong. Um, the law was on our side and the government decided that uh, even though it's like legal legal case it's super boring but the, the European Union actually have um, a law people called the safe harboring law which protects people from being prosecuted for running a platform and the Swedish government decided that does not apply in this case and didn't have to actually go into any details so we lost of them not wanting to give us our rights Right. Uh, so that I'm pissed about. And I'm also pissed about how they just magically didn't get any uh, problems themselves for the super corrupt court case that it was. And mm. if everyone knew there was problems with the court case. Mm. It is I mean, like from really... an unbiased point of view, you know, I looked at this and thought, you know, I'm doing the interview here, I should probably be unbiased. It's kind of hard not to think there was a bit of corruption there. I mean, the, the judge was connected to anti-copyright. He was the, actually, uh, he, the, he was the chairman of the Swedish uh, pro-copyright society. And not only that, he was the chair, vice chairman of the other one, the pro patents uh, uh, copyright lobby in Sweden. And then in the appeal, there was uh, a few years later, there was the new chairman and the vice chairman, who was the lawyer, the the, uh, the jury, and then basically the judges in the case. And the police officer who did the all of the investigation, um, after two and a half years of really slow investigating of pirate pay, all of a sudden it started getting really, really quick. So the half last half year. Uh, he was working for Warner Brothers and Universal as their Scandinavian anti-piracy manager mm. and a police officer at the same time. And right. then this was, of course, big news in Sweden. And uh, the, the Minister of Justice was interviewed about this. And she said, oh, look, we have great police officers in Sweden. Even Hollywood wants to employ them. Mm. That was like her response to this. It's like, oh, so this is not a problem. No, they're great. Look. It's like, OK, this and people like this. This doesn't happen in Sweden. Right. But of course, since there, there are basically no laws against corruption in Sweden, because this is an innocent country, stuff like that doesn't happen. I mean, do you think there was, there was pressure there? I mean, you kind of, Sweden is, is a small country, 10 million odd people. You know, there's the US with, I don't know the stat, but a lot more than Sweden. And, you know, massive, massive industry. Was it kind of, do you think it was a question of, you know, we have to do something here and bend the rules? Because, you know. That was the, what the US government told Sweden which they were super proud of that they did and that they managed to get Sweden to, to do what they wanted. So um, uh, Aktuellt, I think, uh, or one of the big news shows in Sweden uh, showed documents where they, and they interviewed the US government saying, like, basically, we told them either you stop the pirate pay and, and punish people or you're going to be on the trade sanction list with Palestine and Pakistan and Iran, something like that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 
and, and Cuba. An of axis of evil of some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweden, Cuba, Iran, kind of the same. Yeah. And well, then we re I, I, I totally understand Sweden being really, really, you know, uh, afraid of that. But that's when you, you know, have balls or you don't have balls. That's mm. when you do something right or you do something wrong. Or that's when you apologize to people saying like, sorry, I have to punish you. I don't really want to do this. But the, the nasty people over there are threatening me with stuff I can't say no to. Mm. At right. least stand up for being an asshole. Uh, and then, then you went into hiding, essentially, for what? couple of years I didn't go into hiding that's okay. the thing a lot of people say that uh, but I just decided I would not be affected by this I just I kind of live my life normally as I would otherwise mm. um, so I was you just, were outside Sweden for a while for I, but I lived in Berlin so right. it was not like oh, I moved from Sweden like yeah four years before uh, okay. So, and the same thing was like, oh, yeah, Gottfried moved to Cambodia, yeah, four or five years before. Like, we were already outside of Sweden since ages before the court case. Um, and the weird thing is, like, I was just waiting for them to come and pick me up. They didn't. They just took three years. And it's like, I was on the most wanted list with Interpol for many years, and they didn't just pick me up. And I was on flights. And it turned out they didn't have my middle name in the Interpol database, so I didn't match. Well. <laughs> They're not really clever, like, yeah. I mean, how do you handle that kind of stress? I mean, I've been through this process as an entrepreneur. You know, there's so much stress building any form of project, whether it's to make billions or to do good for the world. There's a lot of stuff gets thrown at you. And then to be wanted by Interpol, that must be pretty high on the On, on the, the coolness factor. level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, coolness or it's, however you want to put it. It's on the coolness level. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, how, how you do don't, you handle that? You don't handle it. It just... If it happens, it happens. Uh, if you can look yourself in the mirror, then that's the way to handle it. Like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm proud of what I did. So right. then I don't have to, like, hide or stress about it. Um, I, I always play with stuff when, it, when, when stuff that is weird happens. I just go along with it. So, uh, like, I famously ran for the European Union in Finland, which is one of my home countries. Um, and my, my idea was that, okay, uh, if I get a, elected to the European Union, I will get diplomatic immunity, so I don't have to go to prison, uh, which is great. So that was my idea of how to get out of that problem. It's like, okay, so get me elected. And since I'm anti-racist and it was a growing uh, racist party in Finland, I decided that if I could run in Finland saying like, uh, so there's a party in, in Finland called the, the True Finns. Um, the Swedish Democrats love them, which is ironic because they hate Swedish people. Um, <laughs> like they hate all immigrants, but especially Swedish people. They hate Swedish people the most of everyone, uh, which is it's super funny. But so I ran with this idea that if you elect me, you piss the Swedish government off by giving me diplomatic immunity. So the left wing voted for me because they like me, and the right wing voted for me because they hate Sweden. So <laughs> that was kind of my campaign. I was saying that was basically just vote for me so I get diplomatic immunity. Mm -hmm. And people asked, what, what do you, what well, do you, you want to do? You didn't achieve? win that, but why, why do you think you didn't win that vote? What was because the... I, I didn't really campaign that much. But I, I, did, I did quite good for not doing a lot of work, to be honest. Like, I wasn't that far away from getting a seat in the European Parliament. I wouldn't w like to have one. It was... You know, I don't want to have responsibility. Mm. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to, if you want to laugh at me a little bit more, you can go and see my video on, on YouTube for my my campaign video, which is essentially. I've actually seen it. I would recommend doing that. I would recommend not doing it. But uh, <laughs> essentially, it's me watching into the camera, very romantically flirting uh, with romantic music. Uh, I think it's very white, um, and it just it's, everything is slow motion, and it just ends with Peter the romantic. And I didn't talk politics at all. And the whole idea is, except me being very weird, uh, the whole idea was to get people to, instead of me telling people lies about promising stuff or talking shit about opponents, I rather wanted people to see that I'm a real person. And that was really, was really effective because all of the newspapers wanted to interview me because like, we don't understand you. So here is something weird going on. What the fuck? Right. Uh, so I, got, I think I got eight uh, pages in the big newspaper on the day of the election because of one video, because it was different. Right. Um, so that was fun. Well, you know, look at the US, look at Donald Trump. I mean, many people voting for him just off the ground. He was a real person. Did Maybe you, you're just a bit early. You know? Did you compare him to Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're both humans, I think. Well, I guess you both sure. don't really fit as politicians. That's probably the point that I was trying to make. I would be a better president than he would be. So. Yeah. yeah. 
I would not disagree with that for Thank sure. You. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you know, you didn't become the president of the earth, you know, and you basically, you know, ended up in prison. I mean, I hope this is not an insensitive question, but I mean, what's prison like? I mean, what was it like to, to suddenly end up in in prison for six six months? It wasn't, you know, huge amounts of time, but it's a long time. It was really, really like, I, as you maybe have noticed, I don't like people controlling me. Uh, so that was a huge problem. Uh, also, it was really strange because uh, the people that locked me up the first night, they also wanted my autograph, which is a really strange. Yeah, that's Can you please weird. sign this for my kids? And then uh, it was really, really strange. It was like a mind fuck. Uh, and, you know, they have these weird levels and like really like of security. Everything is a security problem. Uh, if they don't have enough staff, it's a security problem, so you don't get your rights. Uh, so there's a lot of things to complain about. And the, the, the thing in, in everyone says like, oh, it's a Swedish prison, so it can't be that bad. Uh, and exactly everyone says that. Mm. So no one looks at what goes on in prisons in Sweden. Right. So they do basically whatever they want to. So you get treated really, really shitty right. if you're in prison in Sweden. You were like, in a high security, this is like top security yeah, prison, right? Yeah. Because I'm super dangerous. Right, yeah, I, I get that yeah, vibe. They yeah. call me Jesus. Yeah. You know? I was there for other people's sins. Um, right. um, and like, I, was, I, I remember I was sitting there with some uh, a serial killer, a voodoo doctor, and, uh, and another guy who is basically in a gang. And they were discussing who's the worst criminal, and it's like, it's Peter. Because he scams these airlines for airline miles. Right. Uh, it's much worse than what we've done. I'm like, OK. You know, I, I have a. I read a really funny quote. Actually, wrote down. I had, this is in the Guardian, and it says, uh, "In the prison with him is a man, a voodoo doctor, uh, who assaulted a 14-year-old girl to drive the devil out of her. Another man murdered his partner with 60 stab wounds to the stomach, and a cocaine smuggler who made our chocolate muffins. And you say he's the guy I hang out with most. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you kind of find the humor? This is you sitting in prison. I mean. Uh, I've met you briefly today and, and have been exchanging emails with you. By the way, before Peter came today, he sent me an email. The first sentence was, sorry, I can't make it today, dot, dot, dot. And I crapped my pants and then read the rest. He's saying, only joking, I just wanted to get your attention. And like, you know, you seem like a really nice guy. You seem, and you have, and you have, you, know, you are a nice guy and you, and you have this incredible sense of humor. H how do you, I mean, and this is something I think, you know, entrepreneurs, could perhaps learn from because I mean I think humor is important you shouldn't take yourself too seriously but I mean what advice do you have for people when you know you've been through stuff that most people wouldn't dream of going through and to be sitting in prison with you know axe wielding murderers sitting around you and you can still make jokes like yeah. where do you find that ability from well I think uh, when you end up in a situation you end up in a situation either you you know you lie on the floor and you scream which a lot of people do in prison but otherwise you just you know, you're just there. You don't. You can't really do anything. You can't control the situation. So you just have to go with the flow. And I think that's. Yeah, I've been through worse than that. So it's not really the worst that happened in my life. Like so. So that's okay. Like it's what, not what's super the worst happy. that happened in your life? That's private, of course. But uh, in my upbringing, I had a uh, you know problems with my family being very sick. So, um, but so, so you know. You always have like a, a bottom, but you can always, you know, find energy in that as well. Mm. And it was some jokes in prison were really, really funny. People were funny and people have a you have this everyday life as well. And, and you find humanity in everyone. Like, right. Uh, so it is actually it's really, really interesting. You meet people you would never meet before. You find um, you find out more about yourself than you would ever want to, actually, because you have to face yourself in a way. Right. You have to face being alone with, you know, for 12, 12 hours per day. Uh, you have to face people coming up saying like you, now you have to strip because we have to search you for drugs and like I don't even drink alcohol or ever even tried you know smoking tobacco and all of a sudden like they want to look up my ass if I have some smuggled drugs like why I have that problem all the time you do yeah no, you, you no. Like that word? <laughs> so if I, I can tell you a really embarrassing story uh, but it, it is funny um, so I, I was uh, I was I had visitors all the time in prison. Um, like every week there was always someone coming, some journalist, or which pissed the, the, the guards off quite a lot because I, every time they did something wrong, I wrote to someone who published it in a newspaper and then they got shit from their boss for doing that thing. And they felt like I had more power than them in some ways, which was super funny. Um, I even talked to Aftonblad about having a column, but we didn't get it. The, the, new, the, the letters didn't arrive in time, so <laughs> that was probably deliberate, but that's a different thing. Um, but I, I was visited by uh, a politician from the European Union who's in the parliament and uh, 
she of course had diplomatic immunity. And when you have diplomatic immunity, they can't search you when you go to prison to visit someone. Really? Uh, otherwise, they always search through your bag and see that you don't have stuff. So I was preparing for, uh, is this on camera? Yeah. Okay. No. No, okay. <laughs> no, but I was, I was really expecting that after this visit, they will check me more than normal because they will, they, they really pissed at me. They were not super happy with me in prison, um, which is ironic. Um, so, so I was just like, I felt, this is embarrassing, I felt that I had a fart building. Uh, and I decided this person who's going to check me afterwards is going to want to check in my ass. Uh, just, and he's, you know, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to hold it. So uh, one and a half hours of holding a fart. And then afterwards, <laughs> after the meeting, I'm in this room with a guy. And he says, uh, you had a special visit today by someone who we couldn't check. So we have to do a, a special check today. Like you have to just spread, you know, not go in with fingers, but just like look up there. And like. <laughs> You don't want to do that. <laughs> and then it's like, why? I says, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> and it's like, no, I really have to check. I says, I'm warning you, I would not do that if I was you. <laughs> and then it's like really, really interested. And he's like looking. And I, <laughs> and I said, I told you, you should not do that. <laughs> and he was so pissed. He was so pissed. <laughs> and it's because I told him. <laughs> And the most embarrassing thing about this, it's the second time I fart a grown man in the face. Yeah. An adult. But in part two, we'll, we'll talk about the first time. I yeah, think. just me being really upset. Yeah. yeah. It is a great weapon, though. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. I, ha I have used it on occasion. It's powerful. <laughs> How did we get onto farts? I don't know. <laughs> How did we get to this? Um, so, OK, you know, let, let's sort of, you know, when, when were you out of prison? That was uh, this year or last year? No, in 2014. Okay, so it was like, quite some time back. Yeah, two and a um, half years, three years. And since then, you know, Flatty, you mentioned a bit earlier, that's, that's something that was kind of a brainchild, a bit from Pirate Bay in some yeah. respects. You know, I, I guess from my outlook a bit, it was you trying to put kind of a, almost a, a, more of a business model around this concept to see how do we pay the artists. No, it was um, not just about the artists. So do you, people know Flatter? Do you know what it is? Okay, so for those who don't know it, basically it is a payment method it is a flat rate system. So you put some money into the system every month, and then you click things like a like button, similar to a like button uh, was the idea. Uh, and you just share your money equally among the people that you click. Uh, so if you click 1,000 buttons in a month, we'll just share the money by 1,000, and then equal amounts go to everyone. So instead of putting a number on what something is worth, here's the budget you have and the people you want to share it equally to. Uh, so it's a different way of thinking. So it's not just for artists. It's for search results or it's for uh, whatever you want to have put flatters to. Uh, and the idea was to, it was a movement against, uh, about getting flat rate fees in, uh, in, in the European Parliament where they wanted basically to give the, um, uh, the record companies 10 euros per internet connection. That was the lobbying that the music industry was doing. Like for every internet connection you pay us 10 euros on top of that and we get the money and people can free, freely share music. And a lot of parties in Europe wanted to do this. They were like, oh, this will end the copy uh, discussion and everything, and this would be great. We can build great archives and stuff. Uh, and I was not OK with that, because I don't want to give money to these people who are like a centralized unit mm. that doesn't add anything of value. The only thing it would be it would lock in artists to go to these record companies. And I started asking, so what happens with uh, white power music? And like, I, they, can't get, they can't get money. I'm like, OK, so what happens with questionable hip hop music? Oh, they can get money. I'm like, OK, so who decides who can get and who can't get? Do, are we going to have a censorship system now? You know, what happens with this? And what happens when the music, movie industry comes? Because they want to have like 30 euros per month. I'm like, yeah, maybe we can discuss that. So then I, I started asking, so what happens with people who are blogging? Yeah, they, they don't expect money because they don't make money. It's like, why is this not a problem? Why is one industry getting a lot of money? And what about porn, which is 60% of the internet? Are you going to force people to pay 60 euros per month to the porn industry? Mm. And people said, like, no. Like politicians saying no, and I'm asking, why not? Why is one type of content more valuable than something else? Um, and it was very obviously a bad idea to begin with. So Flatter was like a, a, a test to see if we can do something which is more based on people's actual behavior and independence in that way. Right. Yeah. You, you recently sold it. I read in Break It. I think it was to a German company. So you're, you're, not, you're not a shareholder anymore? or you're... No, no. Uh, so I, I haven't been for, for quite a while, but uh, I've been working with Flatter. Um, 
for uh, since day one. Um, and, and, and the whole idea was that, uh, so, so we wanted to have the Flatter system available for everyone. Um, but in the beginning of Flatter, people still had their own websites. They still had their own CMS or whatever you want to call it. But uh, people then merged into Facebook and to Twitter and to Tumblr and to other centralized platforms. And the problem was that we couldn't get like YouTube or Google to actually add Flatter support. So even if people wanted to give money or want to receive money, the platform owners wanted a cut of like 30% to do that. And mm. it doesn't really work with Flatter model to do that. So we couldn't get onto those platforms. And, and then we started looking for ways to kind of circumvent that. So we started working with uh, Adblock Plus, which is really interesting topic for me. Uh, so Adblock Plus is the biggest ad blocker in the world. Um, they have hundreds of millions of users. And since it's a plugin in the browser, we can bypass the the need of actually having um, someone to put in a button on a website. Uh, and Flatter was this, it, it's been super loved by people in, in media um, because it is a way to actually pay people for articles and, and so on. Um, so when we started working with Adblock, uh, I remember a German uh, uh, journalist, uh, they really hate Adblocking in Germany and they really love Flatter in Germany. And this German uh, journalists asked me about uh, the corporation saying like, Peter, how does it feel to work with someone who's so hated by the media industry? I'm like, oh yeah, that would be a problem for me. I don't, I don't know what, and she had no idea about my pirate bag background. She was right. like really oblivious of that, which was really, really interesting. So I was the good guy and they were the bad guys for the media industry. Right. Uh, but it was like a really important corporation with Adblock and Flatter, and that's why they, they bought the company in the end because it, it, it is a good fit, trying to find a different method of paying people uh, for, for good content. Um, so conscious of time, we probably need to, I want to do a few questions from the audience. So I'd, I'd just briefly, in terms of future stuff now, I mean, what are you working on now? Like, what, what is the next five, five years going to gonna be from Peter Sunder? What, what's happening? I, I, no one should ever say the, more, you know, the coming five years. That's boring. Uh, right now, I, I started last week, I, I released a, a domain name reseller, basically a domain name, anonymous domain names, so you can buy domain names from me. Totally anonymous. We don't want to know who you are, what your name is. We just want to have your money. Uh, no, but it, it is uh, that, that's one thing that I always wanted because I've started a lot of weird projects, uh, some nationalist parties, some cults, as I said, uh, weird stuff. Um, but I always had an issue of getting an anonymous domain name. So that's that's one thing that I released. And then I'm working on a, a few TV series. So uh, one series that is in production right now is uh, called The Activists, where I go around the world and I meet activist people, other different genres of activists. Um, I went with uh, Ship to Gaza, which is uh, trying to bypass the Israeli blockade of, uh, of uh, the Gaza Strip, um, and then hung out with activists from them and trying to learn from them and trying to find the issues they have and the things they do right and the things they do wrong, and, and, and documenting that. So I'm doing that. And when is that coming out? Is that so we're filming right now, um, and it's uh, with a Finnish production company and, and sponsored by the public service. Um, and then um, I also wrote a sitcom when I was in prison uh, about entrepreneurships. So it's called Entrepreneurs, uh, basically complaining. It's about two douchebag guys who starts a company doing a really disgusting thing. Uh, it, I think it's super funny. I, I laugh when I read my own script. People have read the scripts, they really love it as well. Uh, and I, I have talked to some production companies who wants to buy the rights. But then I always have this caveat that I, I want to play one of the lead characters and I have no background in acting. I probably suck at it, but it's that's my requirement. And if they don't agree with that, they can't buy this, uh, the script. That's amazing. Um, so they have an issue with that. They say, um, I'm stupid and I agree, but it's fun. That's the, the, the and then I have some other art projects that I'm, I'm working on. And, and I also run, a, you know, an internet provider and a VPN system and other stuff as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and I go with whatever happens. Well, great. I mean, I, I'm going to sort of swap to questions now. But I mean, I, I could talk for hours and hours, but I think we probably uh, what an hour already. So, um, who has quick questions for Peter Sunder here? I think I don't know if you're going to be around much after this, and you're heading to a dinner. I'm heading to a dinner. I don't have my phone on me. I don't right. know what time it is. But... Uh, this is about twenty past eight. But uh, who has questions for Peter Sunder? We have one from Jens here. Uh, can we get a mic, actually, to Jens? If you, actually, uh, I can you have a mic. Yeah, there you go. I don't know why you had two mics, though. You have another mic there. I have mics everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is about uh, the development of internet and uh, regarding the open internet, probably. 
Uh, what are your thoughts or uh, what are your um, um, what are you hoping for and what are you afraid of in the development of the internet? So I'll just repeat the question. I think I can remember that. So it was because I don't think that's going to be on the film. So it was what what are you hoping for and what are you afraid of in the area of the open internet? So um, for me, it's a problem with the whole discussion about the open internet because we haven't really had an open internet ever. It's always been controlled by some companies or some organizations. Um, but the idea of the open internet was in the 90s very big. And then we started using all of these American centralized services. I don't think um, we have a free internet really. I think it's more of a, we have more of a Facebook network than we have an internet, um, which I'm really scared of. And the problem I see is that we're getting more and more limitations on, on the internet. And everything we do wrong in Europe is just being copied to developing countries, to uh, dictatorships and so on, that um, they use us an, as an excuse. So every time we have a new law about infringing on our rights, that will be copied to other uh, countries as well. And then we always have the slippery slope. All of the new legislations coming about surveillance and so on, and data retention, it, it always starts with one thing. Like you see the FRA law here in Sweden where it's legal to uh, monitor all internet traffic passing borders. Uh, every time there's a, like the terrorist attack that happened in Stockholm, people start asking, like, why don't we have this data for this other thing as well? Um, Sweden is particularly interesting in this case because we've never had uh, any archive or registry in Sweden that has not been starting to be used for something else. Mm. Um, and the problem is that when it comes to the internet, uh, we don't really have human rights anymore. We should have the digital human rights um, but we're being infringed on all the time. And since everything is moving to the internet, um, like whatever media you're on, whatever platform you're on, everything is moving to the internet and to a few providers, um, we're getting more and more limited. So we're losing all of the rights we have without discussion about it. Um, so I, so I, and I, I think we can't really stop that. I think that's already a lost battle um, because people in general are okay with it. And it's this kind of like the boiling frog phenomenon. We, we won't say no to it until it's too late. Um, and, and history repeats itself. And that's what's been going on every single time before when we had a centralization of this kind. So like with the Stasi and other entities that were there for the good of people, and all of a sudden they turn out to be the opposite. So that's my scare. It's we, well, I think we already lost it. We have, we're gonna have some freedoms, but not enough, uh, always enough to keep us content, but not happy. Uh, and in general, I think being content is the worst thing ever because you're not really happy, you're not really sad. I rather have an emotional roller coaster where I can be super happy and super sad. But being content is like people don't protest because I'm content. They protest when they're really, really upset about things. Mm. Right. So we're not going to end up there. We're just going to be really, really crappy, mm. but not crappy enough to do something about it. We probably have time for one more question, I think. So one lucky person. Who there's one here, Isma. If you shout your question, I'll... Ref Actually, do you have a microphone? We have a microphone now. Awesome. Uh, thank, thanks for coming. And um, my question is, I'm going to jump from uh, the internet to back to the printing press. Uh, so I, I guess it's, uh, it should be pretty hard to... Uh, just knowing that you're innocent the first day, it, it should be quite hard to accept the fact that uh, now you're in this uh, very high wondering to get from there to a place where you're actually hanging out with uh, the admin people. Uh, how was the sort of the internal dialogue during like the first uh, one or two days of the video? So I'll just repeat that for the video. So the, the short version was how, how was the sort of interaction with the first few days in prison whilst you were sort of acclimatizing to, to that? I think that's the, the short version. No, so, so basically, um, I, I think most people that end up in prison are there uh, for the first time. Uh, so everyone is in the same. Uh, so when you get to prison, you get to like a special uh, department where everyone is just new people. You've just been there for a few days. So everyone is in kind of the same situation. It's like starting school. Like you need to find friends. Uh, and these are people that have been bad at other things. One thing that surprised me is that everyone admitted to what they've done. Like everyone's like, I, I was guilty of this. I was guilty of this. Um, which was really surprising because I, I always thought that people would say like I'm innocent of everything. So I, I think I, um, that was really interesting. A lot of people really ashamed of what they've done. They felt they should be there. Uh, and this, uh, this internal annoyance that you're there but you shouldn't be there is uh, 
at the same time, it's like a few months I've been uh, quite lucky with things otherwise. I've you know, I'm happy in my life. Most people are not happy. I know it's been worse in my life than it was there. Um, I, I, I always acclim acclimatize wherever I go. I think uh, I can find out something good in, in every situation. Um, but then generally it's, it, is, it is interesting. And then uh, I also started getting letters from people all over the world. Uh, some were really, really weird. I got a lot of love letters. Uh, the most disgusting thing, I have a lot of disgusting stories, but it was a, it was a girl from Canada. Uh, she sent me letters every week, sometimes twice per week. First time I got a letter from her, uh, it was just a picture of a girl on a horse, topless, in a sunset. <laughs> uh, and I was like, okay, this is weird. Someone sent me a picture from a magazine or something. And then the next week I got a picture of a topless girl with her friends hanging out. And just like, it's the same girl. And then I got these letters every now and then from this weird Canadian 20 year old you know, uh, with always topless with her friends, which was really strange. <laughs> I'm not really sure where she's from. Uh, and one day, uh, they and were stolen. sell these kind of things in prison, isn't no, that No, they like... were stolen. Okay. <laughs> which was kind of also interesting. I, I knew who stole them, but I didn't really want to, he could have them, that's, that's okay. Maybe he was copying them. Uh, no, he, he did, <laughs> did, definitely didn't copy them. He uh, did something else with them, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it was, really, it was really strange. But then, you know, I, it, was, it was fun in one way, because uh, some days I got 200 letters uh, in one day. Which is interesting because there's a censorship system in prison and that one person working in the postal service all of a sudden there's like 200 letters to read through all of them in different languages and they have to actually have an interpreter to read through them uh and it's like you have a mailbox that's like uh, 10 by 10 centimeters something like that that you can keep your stuff in and i had like cartons huge like moving cartons of letters and candy and chocolate and potato chips everything weird and money coming in there was a guy who sent me chili powder, uh, uh, curry, and a Band-Aid for my stomach because it was so spicy. <laughs> and he sent this as a registered letter. And when you get a registered letter, uh, you have to sign for it. And that means you have to go to a special department in prison. It's like a, an hour kind of task for two people to follow you somewhere. And then you open up one letter and it's like some powder. And they're like, what the fuck? And like, it's curry. And it's, it's like, OK, and a Band-Aid. And it's like, OK, this is strange. This happened every day. There was always adventure in that. Uh, wow. And I had to like Did you send... receive the curry and the chili and yeah, the Yeah, but the thing is, like, you're not allowed to, to take anything in. Like edible things, you can't take in because it could be drugs, right? So uh, maybe this is now OK to say. It's been over two years. But there were a few people working in prison, a few guards that really liked sweets quite a lot. And they knew that I got a lot of sweets. So they always wanted to follow me down to the postal service. And there was a place where there were no cameras where we could st stay and, and eat some, some candy. And they got quite a lot. I remember I got a five kilos of sour gummy bears, <laughs> vegan. And I think the girl gained two kilos. There were the guard working there, like in two kilos from just my gummy bears, uh, which was really funny. Uh, but it, it was it, something that you know most people in prison, they don't get one single letter. Uh, mm -hmm. for two, three years, because people hate them for what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't really be upset about like being in a place where you get lots of love letters all the time. You get, mm -hmm. you, it, there's some happiness to that. Mm -hmm. You don't feel lonely. You feel like pe people care about you. And that's, that's okay for a few months to be in there. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we're sort of... Yeah, what know. happened to the Canadian? I, I never yeah. replied. So <laughs> I didn't want to reply. I think probably she's probably sending someone else pictures on horses. Pretty sure, pretty sure. It Peter, was, but it was the best question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have to wrap up, which I could yeah. go on for hours and hours, but uh, this has been a, a, a privilege for me, a privilege for everybody here, and, and I think you're an incredible guy, and uh, good luck with, uh, with, with everything in the future. And, uh, you too. Let's have a big round of applause for Peter Sundet. Thank you. Okay. Cheers and